Let's focus first on plant adaptations. Why do desert plants look different from plants in other places? The differences reflect adaptations to the main local challenges of too little water and too much heat. Because plants can't move, they've had to adapt to everything that could affect them where they germinate. And some of these adaptations required profound changes. Their physical adaptations generally help them endure or evade the two environmental challenges. As you look at the plants here, think about why they look the way they do. Physical changes usually are responses to environmental challenges. The main plant strategy for enduring lack of water is succulents. That is, the ability to store water for extended periods. All cacti are succulents, but there are some succulents, like agave, that aren't cacti. Let's lay to rest the myth that the water stored in succulents can be consumed safely. If that were true, in this water-starved environment, every animal would have adapted to get at this stored water. And succulents wouldn't stand a chance against the onslaught of thirsty desert dwellers. In fact, the water in succulents is stored in special mucilaginous tissues and aggressively defended by spines, a bitter taste or toxicity, and other means. It definitely is not potable. Succulence involves a number of other adaptations in addition to the ability to store water. For example, succulents usually have extensive root systems near the surface to absorb as much water as possible while it's available. On the other side of the water equation, succulents have adapted to use their stored water conservatively. For example, many succulents use a different form of photosynthesis that allows them to keep their stomata, the pores through which carbon dioxide is absorbed into and oxygen released from plant tissue, closed during the day when conditions are hottest and driest. This change dramatically reduces water loss by transpiration through open stomata. Desert plants also must endure high temperatures. Since the maximum air and ground temperatures here are sufficient to kill plant tissue. There are many visible adaptations to moderate tissue temperature, and some of them also help conserve water. Think about what plants need in order to survive, grow, and reproduce. They need water, nutrients, carbon dioxide, and sunlight. Carbon dioxide is plentiful worldwide. Nutrients vary from place to place, but usually are sufficient. Water and sunlight often are the greatest variables. Here in the desert, water is in shortest supply, whereas in other climates, the greatest need often is sunlight. So in our environment, plants can sacrifice the ability to collect some sunlight energy if doing so keeps them cooler and conserves water. What colors are most desert plants? The dark green foliage found in more temperate climates mostly is replaced here by light green and green-gray leaves. The light colors reflect heat and light at the expense of less photosynthesis, but that's a good trade in arid climates. 
Many desert plants also have small, thin leaves to minimize heat absorption and maximize heat dissipation. Where sunlight is plentiful, large surface areas for photosynthesis simply aren't needed. Jojoba plants are a wonderful example of desert adaptation. The leaves generally are small, thin, and light-colored. They're oriented vertically, which minimizes the surface area exposed to solar heating. Leaves are paired, which provides some measure of self-shading during the day. And they're covered with fine hairs, which further diffuse sunlight. The spines on many cacti certainly provide some measure of protection against being eaten, but they also may provide some shade and trap a layer of insulating still air around the plant surface. Evasion of drought usually involves shedding leaves, roots, and even branches during dry periods. Living tissues require water, so minimizing tissue mass also reduces water requirements. Plants like glow mallow, creosote, and ocotillo that utilize this adaptation may look almost dead during extended dry periods. This adaptation depends, of course, on the ability to grow new leaves and new roots rapidly when water is available so that the plant can use it to grow and reproduce. In some ways, the best strategy for dealing with the challenges of too much heat and too little water is to avoid them altogether. If a plant could live in conditions where water is available and the heat is moderate, then fewer adaptations would be required. But how is this possible for plants? They can't migrate to balmier climates during the desert summer, find a water hole or spring, or even duck under a rock to cool off. There's only one strategy that allows a desert-dwelling plant to completely avoid the twin challenges of this environment, and that's to live out its entire life cycle during the months when the desert is wetter and cooler. This is what annuals, including the wildflowers, do. Annuals germinate from seeds, grow, flower, and die before the weather gets really hot and dry. But before dying, they produce drought and temperature-resistant seeds that can persist for years in the ground, germinating only when conditions again are benign and advantageous for growth. Perennials follow a variation of this strategy by undergoing periods of profound dormancy when insufficient water is available. They, too, resume growth, flower, and produce seeds when water is available and temperatures are moderate. Desert plants have adapted profoundly and successfully to the challenges of aridity. Next, we'll look at how animals can live successfully in this tough environment.